Good morning, everyone, faculty, colleagues, and students. Today I'll talk about the contented approaches to refugee services. And the uh, problem is that there are problems in uh, refugee services. And this is limited to my field work in the Midwest in the United States. There are well-intentioned service providers, but what they provide may not be appropriate to the needs of the refugees. That's uh, the first problem. Secondly, refugees are treated as outsiders who don't have knowledge, skills, and values, and they become alienated in the country which hosts them. And thirdly, therefore, there's a need for alternative interventions to empower the refugees. So these are the problems uh, that we have. Marie and I have found out. One, so what are the mainstream traditional services for refugees? And then secondly, uh, what are some other alternative services provided to refugees in the United States? And we have looked at different uh, refugee, or, uh, refugee service organizations. So the objective is one, to portray what the dominant uh, refugee services are in the Midwest, uh, Illinois, and Indianapolis. Assumptions, cultures change, but we have to go back to history and uh, our context to look at things. This is not uh, strictly from a research academic point of view, but practitioner uh, uh, perspective. Uh, this came out of our uh, work uh, at the university and in research institute. So there are many authors who reminded us that we have to go back to history and the social context. And we should not forget culture, ethnicity, gender, and class when we study people, including refugees. And uh, there's a need not to tell refugees what they need, but to enter into a dialogue that the refugee providers and the refugees are co-learners. And uh, this paper will look at the birth of two projects in Indiana. So, uh, we're saying well, whoever has power also dictates what knowledge is. So that's one uh, perspective from which this paper comes. And the other is othering, uh, that you know some cultures are soft or weak, and, and uh, the dominant culture is strong. So showing static relationship between binary opposites, site visit is uh, one way by which data was collected. Participant observation, we went to uh, visit different uh, refugee service programs in Illinois, Northern Illinois and Indiana. And dialogue with the community, uh, volunteer service providers, landowners, uh, refugees, and also even some documents. So, uh, we put all of these together. Some of the organizations we visited included Catholic charities. Uh, some organizations provide servi uh, services exclusively for Burmese, for Karen. Some don't. Some uh, uh, provide services for all, including Burmese, uh, specifically Karen, Chin, and so on. And then another one in uh, uh, Illinois, Northern Illinois Heartland Alliance for Human Rights and Human Needs. And then there's the Refugee Resource and Research Institute in Indianapolis, of which Maria is the director. And then uh, field visits to some farms, uh, the Chen Farm Project, the Karen Farm Project in Indianapolis, dialogue with the community organizers and refugees. and also uh, an organization that does not serve Burmese, but other refugee uh, and immigrant uh, communities. And another one in Illinois, the Rock Valley College Refugee and Immigrant Services. Uh, they have a Karen community, among others. So this is the typology of the different uh, organizations and funding that they get for their work. And also in the end. And then lecture discussion by some people who are involved in uh, 
refugee and immigration work, as well as a lecture by somebody who was involved in uh, working with Filipino immigrants and refugees, as well as a uh, uh, professor who was also the director of a organization in Chicago serving the Korean community, but they work alongside other communities and spoke with someone who's a political society and an immigrant as well to learn from their experiences. So dialogue. So first we need to go back and look at the historical and social context. So we need to discuss and find out what they are. And uh, case study one is a farm project with the owner of the land uh, with us there, and then a uh, weaving project. Okay, so two uh, case studies based on field work. And Maria, the co-author of this paper, is the director of the uh, Refugee Resource and Research In Institute in Indianapolis. And myself, we bring from Northern Illinois University, we bring people to to field work, to interview people, uh, organizations, and refugees in the surrounding area and in Indianapolis. So in, uh, in Indianapolis, there are tons of refugees from different parts of the world. And uh, about half of them are women. And so bearing that in mind, that's a complex of some type of work should be taken into account. Uh, refugees come from different backgrounds, but they all, many of them uh, have some form of estrangement. So findings, so what are, based on all of the organizations that we have visited, uh, one is the basic needs approach to refugee services. Uh, what does that entail? Uh, so we spoke with some refugees uh, in, this is in the Midwest, of course, we need an interpreter. And the first model looks at the uh, all-knowing cultural outsider okay, who talks and tells people what you need to know and do. It's very hierarchical and it's top-down. It's a cultural, uh, the dominant cultural group uh, who runs the organization. But they provide very important services, allowance, grocery, housing, health care, and interview and how to get a job. Those are important. But the method is banking, I teach you what you need to know. And the learners are treated as you don't know anything. We need to teach you. Okay, so with that, you have a mismatch employment and people are not satisfied, low quality of life because they're considered as others. They are, their voices are disembodied, they don't matter. The refugees don't matter. It's the all-knowing refugee provider who talks and tells you what to do. It's a reproduction of the social order in the U.S., in the Midwest, Indiana, and Illinois. So people just need to go to work. They provide uh, productive labor. Uh, and then uh, what they need to do is to perform well. And the stereotype is for all Karens, all Burmese who work very hard, uh, they don't complain, they just do what they have to do. So this is the dominant culture reproducing itself with a subservient uh, refugee community. But bear in mind, they provide very good uh, services. So the model is assimilation. You have to know how to look at people straight in the eye. You have to have a very firm handshake. You have to write your uh, resume this way. So this is kind of social control. And you should not wear sandals. That's not proper attire. So, I mean, we heard all of these uh, when uh, they were teaching uh, the refugees. So we have very powerful refugee providers uh, helping the powerless refugees. So this is the deficit model. Refugees know nothing. You have to absorb everything that we have to teach you. Values, skills, knowledge, concepts. You're there to learn from us. That's what the refugee service providers do. And refugees are just passive receptacles, absorbing everything they're told, what is good or right and proper to be done. 
So they provide jobs, and we ask what kinds of jobs? Mostly factory-based. So what if they have other skills? And they say, well, that's what we can easily find jobs for them. So training includes how to dress up, eye contact, and all kinds of uh, expectations from the dominant culture. So it's, again, othering us versus them. And the knowledge base of refugees are not recognized. They're made invisible. So refugees are cultural outsiders. So if you want to live in this society, you better learn how we do things and do it right. Okay, so it's privileging the cultural insiders. And most of the refugee service providers are none, uh, not from the culture of the refugees. But there's a multiple layer of relationship that uh, arises. The refugees who speak English well become very powerful. Sometimes the children are more powerful than their parents because they can mediate between two worlds. And parents just listen to the kids and say, please translate it for me. So uh, the second approach is the human rights-based approach. So from the human needs approach to the human rights-based approach. It's different from all the organizations we saw. So finding the deficiencies, but also the contributions of the human needs approach, uh, Maria uh, spoke with many of the uh, Karen and Chin refugees in Indianapolis and say, so maybe we should sit down and talk with you and, and listen to you instead of us telling you what to do. So it's a reversal of knowledge production. There are co-learners now uh, sit down the volunteers, community organizers, refugees, the leaders among the refugees sit together and say, yeah, you need painful employment, but not necessarily factory work only. So the second approach is to empower uh, the, instead of marginalizing the refugees, is to empower the refugees. And it's a question of social justice. It's not just, you have enough to eat, shut up, rather, uh, the, the refugees have the right to their voice and say what we want to do. And uh, Maria spoke with some landowners and they said, okay, we have a big tract of land and many in some in food bank, in uh, commercial farm. They said, yeah, you can use a portion of this land. And then at the same time, the community learned about the refugees. And there are some different crops which are planted, you know, the bitter melon, uh, basil, stuff that, uh, Thai basil, not the Italian basil. So people learn from one another. The produce are sold, and there are also different farming practices. Um, this is bottom up, uh, culturally sensitive, again, taking into no consideration that culture changes. It's not static. And uh, right now, refugees are not considered as empty vessels but us co-equal partners from whom refugee providers co-learn. So instead of assimilation, like in the first model, human needs approach, this is integration. You have something to contribute. You are people with knowledge, skills, and values that the community can learn as well. So there were people who got involved in the farm project. Uh, there's the Chin Farm Project, there's Karen Farm Project. So. Uh, Maria spoke with many of the members of the community, the leaders of the community, pastor, uh, uh, played an important role, Christians and Buddhists. And now, uh, the second one is, the, one is the farm project, the other is the weaving project. And uh, people who were not involved in the farming project uh, uh, were able to join the weaving project. And I say, can everyone join? Yes, technically yes. But the tradition is women are the ones who do weaving. I said, are you sure? She said, it was open, and that was the decision of the community. So this is not to say that basic needs approach is not necessary. Rather, we need something else to complement the basic needs approach. But then there, there needs to be a gender response. Because what about people who can't find work, or not given work for some reason or another, and then the Weaving Project came also from the community. They said, we want to maintain our culture, weave our club, and maybe make some products we can sell. So they could 
we came from the employed as well. And farm, because around Indianapolis, there's a lot of farms, and people in the community offer their land for use. Part, and they found out that the landowners were very angry, saying, why do you go farming when it's raining? You should not. And then the current said, but this is the best time to go farming, because it's wet. The, so they, they got confused. There was a shock. And they learned that, oh, there's another way to farm. When it's wet, you go out and have fun in the rain and work the wheel. Okay, so, but then the uh, weaving project uh, was, again, for people who were not able to participate in the farm project. And Maria bought some of those with the help of uh, funding agency because they needed more. And the women keep the loom in their apartments and they rotate so they can, and they teach one another how to make uh, textile. And they, they organized, so Maria just started this, but then the community organized their own uh, grassroots organization, and women will profit from the products that they produce. But then the initial materials were provided by the funding uh, organization for uh, them to be able to buy the looms, the, the cloth, everything from, in fact, Thailand. So there are well-meaning refugee service providers, but what they do are necessary but not sufficient. Something else has to be done. So the dominant uh, refugee service had to be supplemented with something else. Plus, to be gender sensitive, what about women who are not able to get jobs because they were women for one reason or another? So this paper uncovered a privilege practice of the dominant practice in the refugee service. Okay? The I teach you, you, you have to learn from me. And the other approach is the human rights based approach, empowering the refugees. It's not a binary, but complementary. So you have, uh, instead of the disembodied voices, you have the authentic voices of the refugees being heard. And if they want another project, then maybe they'll come up and say, we'll look for funding and do this. Instead of simulation, it's integration. Keep your identity as you wish, however you see. And refugees are not done. They have knowledge, skills, and values. And we have to empower refugees by listening to their voices. So we need, well, we need to have training on the dominant culture, but it's not uh, sufficient. So we need to look further to empower refugees by talking with the refugees, entering into dialogue, and uh, empowering them by letting the refugees be able to have culturally appropriate uh, projects which they need and want, and they can be gainfully employed at the same time. And these are all of the model building based on our experiences. I'll just skip them. So, we need to do both, uh, provide food for the table, have a job, but also to empower the refugees, uh, uh, taking into account the uh, knowledge base of the refugees. So think outside the box. Instead of just performance, do well in the job, in the factory, and learn how to behave like Americans, to also empower the refugees by using the human rights-based approach and culturally appropriate refugee services. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, we have been a bit more talkative than um, expected, but we have uh, 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you have uh, questions for all panelists, please give now because we have a huge group, so uh, any question or comments or remarks or
five, so I'm going to now set this to 